Today is Tuesday. It's April the 25th, 2023. My joy to come to you with today's Heart of a Shepherd devotional, the title, The Final Census, Women's Rights, and a New Leader. Our scripture reading, Numbers 26 and 27. I'm really not going to take time for a review, but I'm going to remind you what we're studying in Numbers 26 followed a gross adultery, idolatry that was discovered, and the slaying of 24,000 people. Well, that brings us to Numbers 26. Here we have the final census before the promised land. Now, a census of the 12 tribes was first taken in Numbers 1 through 4. And I would remind you, a whole generation, 20 years and older, had died in the wilderness. The only exception was Joshua and Caleb. Well, some of the tribes were smaller. Other tribes had experienced a significant growth. And so we have Numbers 26, 5 through 50, the names and the numbering of the 12 tribes recorded. Now, the question then follows the land. How was the land to be divided. Well, as we look at verses 52 through 62, the census that was taken was necessary not only to number the men of war, but also to ultimately assign territory to each of the 12 tribes. Now, a reminder is found in verse 62 that the tribe of Levi would not receive land. Why is that? Because the Lord would provide for those he had chosen to serve him. Now, a sobering reminder is also found in verses 62 through 65, where we are reminded of God's judgment upon Israel, that first generation out of Egypt that turned back and refused to trust and obey the Lord. Now, that brings us to Numbers 27. And Numbers 27 is particularly instructive because here we have women's rights of inheritance that are addressed. And so I invite you, follow this fascinating reading and study of Numbers 27, because here is a case study of women's rights God's way, not man's. Now, let's look at what the Bible says. Now, the, the question would follow about what of a household in which there are no sons born and there are only daughters. Well, the illustration of that was addressed, Numbers 27 and verse 1 through 2, where we have five daughters of a man who had died. Now, they were of the tribe of Manasseh. Those five daughters came to Moses and Eliezer, who is now the high priest. Uh, Aaron was his father. Now, their father, the five daughters, the father of the five daughters, had died, leaving no male heir, leaving no son. And therefore, the daughters came to plead their case regarding their father's right of inheritance in the promised land. Now, according to the law, a man's estate was to pass to his sons. However, what became of a man's possessions when there was no son? And so we look at Numbers 27 and verse 4, where the daughters reason. Why should the name of our father be done away from among his family because he hath no son? And so the daughters pleaded that, their, or that they and their father had been slighted and petitioned, given to us, the five daughters, a possession among the brethren of our father. Well, rather than make a hasty, uh, ill-advised decision or even trust men's opinion, Moses withdrew, and we read in verse 5 and then verse 6 that he brought the cause, the case, of the daughters before the Lord. Well, the Lord affirmed this, the assertion of the five sisters, the five daughters, and answered Moses, verse 7, Thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel, saying, If a man die and have no son, then ye shall cause his inheritance to pass unto his daughter. What a wonderful, gracious God who is just we have here. Now, there is a clause found in verses 9 through 11 to ensure a family's possession would remain within the tribe. It was determined that should a man die and have neither a son nor his daughter, his inheritance would pass to his next of kin. Well, in verses 12 through 13, we now have recorded before us what I would describe as the end 
of an era, and that is Moses' imminent death. And so we find in verses 12 through 13 that the Lord commanded Moses, Get thee up into this mount, Abram, and see the land which I have given unto the children of Israel. And when thou hast seen it, now look at verse 13, Thou also shalt be gathered unto thy people as Aaron thy brother was gathered. In other words, Moses, I'm going to give you an opportunity to see the land, but you shall die. Wow, a changing of the guard. Now, the desire of Moses, being the shepherd that he was, was that there would be a man chosen to take his place who would be a man of God's choosing. And so Moses then was reminded that he would not enter into the land of promise. With humility, he accepted the consequence of his sin with grace. According to verse 16, like a true shepherd, Moses requested the Lord, set a man over the congregation. Now Moses desired, verse 17, to ensure his successor would be a man of God's choosing and a man with a shepherd's heart. And so we read in verse 18, God chose Joshua the son of Nun, a man in whom is the Spirit, that is, the Spirit of God. And then, leaving no uncertainty that Joshua was his choice, in verse 19 through 20, the Lord directed Moses, confirm Joshua before all the congregation. And so verse 23, we read, Moses obeyed the Lord, took Joshua, laid his hands upon him, and then gave him a charge as the Lord commanded. Well, I need to close this devotional for today. And I might say this, although Moses was one of the most extraordinary men ever to live, Moses inevitably went the way of all flesh. And we read in verse 13, He was gathered unto his people as Aaron, his brother, was gathered. Miriam was dead, his sister. Aaron was dead, his brother. And because Moses had disobeyed the Lord and sinned before all the people, Moses would die without entering the promised land. You know, I'm reminded as I close that it has been said that the best of men are men at best. And surely that is true. And their lives are no more than what James observed, a vapor that appeareth for a little time and then vanisheth away. You know, there are many that ignore and deny the haunting fact that it is appointed unto men once to die, but after this the judgment. However, godly men pray, so teach us to number our days that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom. Psalm 90, verse 12. Now, I close with this thought. Make today count for eternity. Do what Paul challenged the church at Ephesus to do. Walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise, redeeming the time, because the days are evil. Thank you, my friend, for joining me as we continue the chronological study of God's Word. And thank you for following the heart of this shepherd. God bless you and bye-bye.